recording. I'm gonna... Okay, we have a quorum. So what I'm going to do is uh, call a meeting to order. And um, I guess we can do the pledge. We might have to do that. We've got an agenda to do. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Okay. We have public input. We have any uh, any public input? Any? Okay. Consideration of minutes of special meeting, November seventeenth. Um, Do I have the minutes? Does everyone have the minutes? Did everyone get the minutes? Uh, they would have gotten them, I think, after the meeting. I don't know if they're sent out, but okay. Uh, um, let's see. We had the approval of the minutes from the regular meeting on January twentieth. Uh, we had the actuary report. We had the actuary report first year pension valuation actuarial performance review of defined benefit plan. We had consideration of 2022 regular meeting schedule, and then we had the adjournment. Um, the the uh, town police pension assumed rate of return was 6.5%. Uh, Michelle Boyle presented and discussed uh, and, and vote all in favor of motion uh, approved unanimously. So that, that's basically the minutes. Uh, do I have a... Uh, a um, I move to approve the minutes. Second that. Do I have a second? I'll second that, yep. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All approved. Okay. Now we got the next thing is election of officer. Um, who wants to be chairman? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll volunteer for another year. Perfect. <laughs> okay with you too. <laughs> I'll stay in it for another year. I'm only a hundred years old, so I guess I can live another year. <laughs> You're doing a great job, Ed. Um, Ed, isn't that a two-year? Uh, isn't that a two-year contract? Uh, no, I think a three-year contract. <laughs> How often do we renew? <laughs> I think you're supposed to do it every year. Every year. No, we do it every year. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, I don't think anybody fights you for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I used to be chairman for years, and yeah. and um, we rotated, you know, and uh, and then I, I got it again. Um, so why not? Somebody's got to make. Are you officially making the motion, Ed? And somebody's going to second it. Well, so I'll make the motion that uh, we elect Edward A. Costco uh, uh, chairman for the next year. I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Um, now we need a vice chair. Yeah, we need a vice chair. Um, I'll volunteer to continue. Okay, and uh, I second that. And uh, we'll make a motion to um, approve the uh, vice chair. All in favor? Is it James? James. Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Okay, <clears throat> pass. Now I think that's it. We have the roster. We need secretary treasurer. Or... I don't think so. Okay. I don't think like the board's big enough to ask them anymore. No. So so that should be uh, good. So the next thing is the annual review of investment policy statement. So yep. I'm going to turn it over to Mike and let him start. Yeah, so um, we've had the same investment policy statement now for 20 years. Um, the investment policy statement, it, it's good to be aware that the document exists. Uh, an investment policy statement is really just a summary of responsibilities. What's my responsibility? What's Nolan's responsibility? Um, sort of the guidance. Um, Morgan Stanley has, we use Clearwater Analytics so that there's daily monitoring of the portfolio as it relates to the investment policy statement. So if there ever were, and investment policy statements are, the, the way they're built is to be very general and very wide open. Um, I can go back 20 years ago where, you know, committees would want to really have these specific uh, investment policies and it was just nonstop violation of the IPS. So we, we have a wide enough net to allow uh, 
us to be nimble and for us to reallocate accordingly. And so um, I would expect this year to be no different like the last 20 um, uh, that you guys would approve this general uh, investment policy statement. And, and um, again, the, the key to an investment policy statement is flexibility. So it's got to be practical, practical, but it can't be pinning us down uh, every move we make. So the you know the commission has approved it. Uh, you know, like I said, 20 years in a row. I, I would expect this year to be no different. Um, and I'm going to apologize. Uh, I was thinking I had I should have gotten Mike's reports and had them sent out to the committee. Uh, so Mike, if you could send me those reports yep. after the meeting, and we'll send it out to everybody. Yep. Sorry about that. Yeah, if I could just um, uh, make note here on this investment policy statement, and we've kept this in over the years. There's certain prohibited assets that well, we don't consider, and that includes commodities and futures contracts, private placements, limited partnerships, venture capital investments, real estate property, and interest-only IO, uh, principal-only PO, and and our residential uh, uh, tranche of CMO. These are the things that we stay away from, and uh, that's something I, I don't think we want to open. We we can do anything else and everything else. The, the, and the real estate, by the way, is the hard physical asset. Correct. And by not like there isn't a municipality that allows any of those investments. Right. Those investments are speculative and illiquid. So I, I'm guessing that as a committee, you guys are not going to want to invest in something that, God forbid, the ball goes the wrong way, it instantly becomes worthless. Yeah. That, that's why those, those assets are free. Yeah, I mean, over the years since the 90s, when we um, hired Mike 20 some years ago, and uh, we broadened out our, um, you know, investment objectives and everything, at, at one time we were only in tranches and things that we got out of them at a very good time and actually made money on them. We were lucky that a few months later they dropped. Uh, but then we started to go into broader investments, and over the years we broadened them out some more. Where it's structured now, but these prohibited assets have always been prohibited, and I wouldn't entertain what Mike say that we change that at all. Um, and then the aggregate investment account asset allocation guidelines as Mark, uh, we have those and we haven't really changed those over the years either. Minimum, maximum, and preferred for the equity fixed income alternatives, cash, and equivalents. And we pretty much go by that. We also go by keeping certain assets liquid so we can pay out. Um, what we call uh, uh, our normal distribution without having to interrupt investment. We keep a certain amount of liquid cash and that's in there too. So if um, anyone has any um, input other than that, uh, let me know. This is the annual review. Usually what we do after that is if no one has any objections, we, we approve it for another year. Anyone have any comments or, or any other input they want to do on the uh, on the statement of investment policy objectives and guidelines? Okay. Um, then I'm making a motion that uh, we um, continue with the uh, statement of investment policy objectives guidelines as uh, currently uh, uh, enforced. Do I second that. that. I'll second. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So fast. Uh, okay, now we get performance review of defined benefit plan. Yep. Yeah. So those of you that are in the room, um, we usually put these all together, but just so we're all on the same page, we'll start with employees, then we'll go to police, and then we'll finish with OSAP. Uh, but before we get there, just to kind of uh, a market kind of update. Um, you may remember from previous meetings that our CIO, Mike Wilson, uh, was pretty um, confident that we would have a uh, correction, which uh, driving here today, uh, the NASDAQ officially hit correction territory, which is a drop in 10% or more. Um, funny thing about the NASDAQ, because our CIO, Mike Wilson, thought that the drag down would be led by the mega cap technology stocks and you know as we fast forward here today he's been right uh 
half of the stocks in the NASDAQ are down 50% or more. And the speculative, you know, 100, 200 PE ratio uh, companies that really walked on water through the pandemic. Um, you, you could pick on, you know, poor businesses like Peloton. Uh, you could pick on the speculative nature of, of Appian or, you know, Square, which has now become Block. And really the most speculative, high performing asset classes have kind of quietly had a, a, a real meltdown. And perhaps this is the start of the correction that our CIO has been calling for. Corrections are scary words, uh, but let's remind ourselves that on average, the S&P drops 14% every year. So we have corrections all the time and corrections are healthy, corrections are normal, and corrections are long-term how this whole thing works. So there's been a rotation um, Morgan Stanley is actually referring to it as the great rotation and that you aren't necessarily seeing money coming out of stocks, but you are seeing the rotation, uh, the best performing sector once again, uh, year to date is oil, right? But keep in mind, I mean, oil and oil related companies, if you own any of those personally or you follow those, I mean, they got taken to the woodshed in 2015 and uh, have, have really kind of linked along and um, early in the pandemic, you might remember all the pipelines were full, the demand fell off the roof, and we had ships sailing out, out the sea loaded with, with, uh, with oil and, and natural gas that they couldn't drop off because the pipelines were full. And once again, we tested, uh, you know, $20 on WTI, which, you know, oil, people sort of, you know, we, we believe in global warming and, and understand that there's got to be changes to things like, uh, uh, you know, industrial combustion engines. But when you have um, a financial system, in particular banks in the mid part of the country, when oil tested $20 a barrel, uh, there was talk or concern of another financial crisis because of all the banks that are overexposed to those companies. So with this rotation, we've seen, and it's quite frankly, for me, it's been refreshing because there's a flight to quality, right? There's a, there's a flight to lower PE companies. By the way, the NASDAQ, uh, which just, as we know, just hit a correction, half of the stocks are down 50% or more, still trading 27 times earnings and historically it's traded 20 times earnings so there there is definitely some some more froth but you know most most if not all of the stuff that we're talking about isn't what the pension owns right we're, we're not we're not invested in these high flying uh speculative names in fact uh the way our cio put it if you want to go buy snowflake or if you want to go buy block you know, these companies trading with multiples that are just uh, through the roof, that you're on your own and, and, and just be careful. And when I say refreshing, um, it's not like I enjoy this, that oil is the number one performing sector, but there has been a return to, you know, companies with clean balance sheets, little or no debt, companies with top line sale, sales growth, you know, north of 15, 20, some of them 30%. Predictable steady dividends, right? Companies like Pfizer, companies that have that have consistently paid out or perhaps even raised their dividend, you know, through good times and bad, you know, over the last 20 and 50 years. And that return to quality, um, you know, is, is sort of refreshing in that, you know, uh, the, the speculation and the high flying stuff is, is, is really uh, in for tough times. And we think that that trend is going to continue. We talk about equities, right? That's kind of in within the United States. We had another banner year in the S&P 500. Um, you guys are probably aware that there are now five names in the S&P 500 that represent 35% of that index. And they are these large cap technology companies that we're talking about. Um, 
But if you think about investing in global, you know, the, nothing's beat the S&P in the last 10 years, nothing. Okay, the S&P has doubled every four and a half years in the last 10 years, annualizing at 18%, right? And nothing has beat it. And, and the, the S&P 500, from a multiple standpoint, it isn't cheap, right? So depending on which sector you look at and what company, there's lots of value in there. There's lots of companies that, that aren't, you know, uh, trading at, at those lead levels. But there's also a big investment world outside of the United States. And if you look at the IFA, IFA which is the benchmark of international stocks in the last 10 years, nothing. I mean, a 10 year return outside of the United States is 2%, right? But remember the 10 years before these last 10 years, it's the lost decade. The S&P 500 annualized at negative half a percent. Where was all the money made during that? It was all out of overseas. Uh, the emerging markets, uh, the, the, the mature uh, you know, European countries. And so I wouldn't be in a rush and that there is definitely value outside of the United States. And we have a position uh, internationally. And we think that the roadmap for, for those companies, just from a valuation standpoint, S&P trading 20 times earnings, where you got Germany and Japan, you got other countries, their aggregates are trading six and seven times earnings. And, you know, you think international, sometimes your first inclination is risk. Well, I mean, go, go to CVS or the stop and shop, walk down the aisles, and every other product that you see is not from the United States. So uh, companies like Nestle, there, there, there are plenty of companies, uh, Volkswagen, outside of the United States that um, are certainly, you, you would, you would, you're not even sure that they are outside of the United States. So. Uh, we'll get into the diversification of our equities and that that's sort of a summary of last year um morgan stanley's outlook for the next 10 years returns have been pulled forward because of COVID. consumers bought and sold more goods because of COVID. interest rates got pinned down to zero again because of COVID. Right, and that the consumer, the helicopter money from the government, the party's over, and that deck that they wanted to build, that generator they wanted to put in, the TV, the flat screen that they wanted, they probably already have it. And one of the concerns of the outlooks that Morgan Stanley has is, listen, inflation, no doubt, is real, it's here, but Morgan Stanley thinks there's going to be a pullback in demand because the consumer has consumed, the helicopter money is over, and that the supply is going to catch up. Right? So we, move all, we all know about shortages of supply chain issues, but uh, one of Mike Wilson's concerns for the end of 2022 is too many things on the shelves and the demand not quite being there. So um, again, that's, listen, it's why we diversify it. And our outlook for capital markets, we, we don't expect the next 10 years to be like the last 10 within the S&P. Um, and, and that, you know, through, through diversification, and, and we've all seen it. Sometimes stocks carry the ball, like last year. Sometimes bonds carry the ball. You might remember these pension plans in 08, where the S&P was down 51%, we were down 12, right? Why? Well, bonds in 08 carried the ball. The aggregate was up 8%, right? So, so through the nature of diversification, through the three asset classes, equities, and we'll break those down, fixed income, we'll break those down, and alternatives, we'll break those down, is that, you know, through, uh, uh, your generic 60 40 portfolio you know it's funny because we we him and haw on the actual rate of return right and you know six and a half versus seven and a half and 
and no one would do this, but if we were all stocks, <laughs> I mean, we double the expectation of our, now who would do that? Mm -hmm. And what would have that felt like in a way, what would it have felt like in the beginning of COVID? You'd think we just, you know, but the reality is you look at the 20, you look at the 10, 15, 20 year return on equities, and as a committee, you may go, you know, uh, these, these returns are monstrous and they significantly outperform our expected rate of return. Um, I'm gonna move on to fixed income, all right? So we're, you might remember this in past meetings, right? So we never thought we'd be 10 years at 0% interest rates. We never thought we'd be at 15 years at 0% interest rates. And now thanks to COVID, you know, we're now looking at 20 years of zero, right? And so rates have moved up year to date. What does that mean? Bond values have come down. Why are bond values coming down? Well, one is inflation, right? If you're going to earn 2% and have your guaranteed a principal, but inflation is seven, your real return is negative five. That doesn't sound like a good idea, right? So inflation is, is, is definitely a concern and it's something that the consumers get kind of slapped in the face with it every day, right? You go to the grocery store, you fill up your tank, uh, you, you pay your electric bill, you, you're, you're constantly reminded of the negative impacts of inflation to your purchasing power. The second is tapering. Uh, we were talking about the amount of treasuries that the treasury owns. And the tapering, I mean, they're going to go from buying 1.7 trillion of fixed income in the open market, that's treasuries, agencies, and investment grade corporate, to zero. They're walking away from the bond market. So is the bond market going to stand on its own two feet? Well, one wall of worries is inflation, the next is tapering, and then rate hikes, right? So if you're sitting in a uh, a 10 year, right? What the yield on the 10 year now is 1.88. So you own a, a 10 year duration paper at 188.88. Uh, maybe you played par value 100 for it. And you have these three things inflation, tapering, and rate ice. What happens to that 10 year 188 when overnight Fed phones goes to 1.5? And you get the same return overnight. As you did for 10 year paper, what happens is the value that they, the, 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 the value of those bonds drop. Okay, so is the, is the yield curve going to be going this way? Is it going to be flat? Is it going to be inverted? And all of the sort of predictions that come off of the yield curve, it's going to be a great opportunity for this pension plan. 74% of the bonds we own are going to mature before 23. We are ultra short, we are ultra safe, and you'll see what the returns look like from last year. 100% uh, of, of the bonds that we own in the pension are gonna mature before 26, right? So inflation continues to pick up. The tapering begins and the Fed walks away, bond market stays on its own. And then we got rate hikes. What this pension plan wants to see is the value of those bonds go down because very quickly we can go because when you have paper due in 2023 there comes a point where inflation interest rates tapering doesn't freaking matter because if you own a bond that matures in 12 months and you're going to get back a hundred bucks there's a point in time where everyone is going to buy that Right, as you get closer to that maturity date, why would you not pay 99 and a half for something you're going to get a dollar back for? Right, and so we're, we're entering that period now. And so now's a good time to be buying those short term fixed incomes that are trading below par. Okay, a year ago you did it, you got 50 basis points. Right now, you go a year and a half out, you're getting one percent guaranteed at maturity. And so, um, listen, when we went to the ultra short, ultra safe, you might remember we came out of Newberger and Berman where the average duration was, was eight and a half years. 
now we're in short duration, uh, we're going to have an opportunity to, to really maximize our fixed income in the not too distant future. Um, because we can get out of any of these fixed income, ultra safe, ultra liquid, and we will get what they're trading at, right? Um, and that with time, so much of that is forced, is pushing up against its par value so that we have a lot of dry powder um, when the disruption happens within fixed income, which, you know, it's COVID is maybe, we're God willing on the getting close to the other side of this nightmare. But that's going to be the wild factor. I mean, if, if we have another variant, they ain't raising rates. They're not. I mean, it, it, you know, uh, they could hold, they could go back to bond buying, and, you know, QE9. Um, but if you think about the potential in 12 months, if we're, you know, on the other side of this and the whole reopening is here, and, Tapering is done, and we're when we're in the middle of rate hikes. You can certainly see the disruption that's coming in fixed income, and the opportunity that we have. Lastly, alternative investments, uh, MLPs. You'll see the returns for last year were monstrous, uh, forty and a half percent. MLPs did have a, 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 a in COVID, they did not do well at all. I think they're down fifteen. We'll, we'll look at it. Um, but MLPs are, are energy infrastructure, and we can't, this country can't survive. It's similar to a municipal bond or, or a REIT, uh, those MLPs avoid double taxation. So all of the earnings go get passed on to the shareholder. And these, these, these natural, these pipelines, whether it's nat gas, whether it's hydrogen, if energy in this country is going to be stored, transported, imported, used, Brought, like it has to have the infrastructure and alternatives that we own as a committee uh, as a pension um, they really are the ultimate hedge against inflation hard assets so real estate MLPs by the way publicly traded real estate as opposed to you know pension plan going and buying a shopping center that's that's what we're not allowed to buy um, real estate is actually one of the sectors within the S&P, there's 11 sectors one that grow. So that's kind of a, a backdrop of the asset class. You can hop on the uh, Town of Bethel employees to page four and get into high level of uh, sort of what happened. Uh, pension plan for 2021 uh, was up 12 and a half percent. This is the town plan. Uh, you can see there that um, rate of return, and that's a $4.4 million uh, gain. And then going back to 2019, uh, gained $8.6 million or annualizing at 10%. So, uh, you know, if you had somebody blindfolded and, and explained to them that these returns that you're seeing there are right through the beginning and where we are today in COVID, uh, that you'd probably be you know, pleasantly surprised uh, by the upside. So, um, twelve and a half percent last year. Uh, moving on to the asset allocation. Um, now you've seen the investment policy statement. You can see that as of twelve thirty one, <clears throat> that we're about fifty percent equity, ten alternative, uh, forty one percent fixed income. <clears throat> the managers that we have within these asset classes, if they grow or shrink by greater than three and a half percent, it's automatically shrink. So if we have a small cap value manager that has an excessive rate of return, that piece is peeled off and it could be bought into one of the pieces that were down. So there's a constant reallocation going on. Uh, Morgan Stanley has that technology known as UMA. And that, so we're constantly going to be brought back to this. Uh, I guess the point is, we're not going to wake up one day or at next quarter and all of a sudden our equity is 70% because, you know, stocks have done so well and bonds have done so poorly. So we'll, and again, Clearwater Analytics is an independent third party that monitors our investment policy statement daily to the portfolio. And so you can see that 
you know, right now we're at sort of uh, where, where, where we where our target is that 50, 40, 10. Turning the page on page five, you can see we talked about international. Of our US, of, of our equity portfolio, we're 65% domestic. Uh, and we're 35% uh, overseas, a little small sliver of emerging markets, frontier markets. Actually, we, do, we don't have emerging market managers, but two of our managers, Clearbridge, that, um, they, within their perspectives, they have the, the ability uh, to buy emerging market to a limited percent. So uh, you can see there that on the equities that we have a significant uh, piece outside of the United States. And remember that international piece, Morgan Stanley has high expectations on, um, and that the 65%, you know, that's that's what really delivered the performance um, in the last two years. Moving on to our fixed uh, income, uh, again, short, safe, liquid. <clears throat> we talked about the duration and the high quality. These are treasuries, agencies. Um, here's where we're going to have the opportunity. Maybe it's at the next meeting. Maybe it's the meeting after that. Um, we're going to have the opportunity to redeploy this capital uh, when the disruption occurs inevitably within fixed income. Um, we'll get to the returns of each individual sector, but it shouldn't surprise anybody in the room that um, you know fixed income had incredibly ho hum returns, right? In the last few years, with rates are where they are, with all the disruptions within fixed income. But let's remind ourselves that you know in 08, when you know Newtown was down 55 percent, all these we read about all these towns. And, uh, you know our, the reason why is we had a healthy amount in fixed income, which was up. Uh, as I mentioned over over eight percent. Uh, page eight is the alternative investments. Um, and you know these are terrific hedges against inflation, um, terrific dividend paying, high quality, low volatility, you know, in normal market conditions. And uh, I think they've been a, uh, an important piece that we, you know, added to the portfolios uh, a few years ago. And so you know, there's other types of alternative investments. Morgan Stanley's, we are we are the biggest provider of whether it be hedge funds or private equity or private credit. You know, those, those, those assets are illiquid. <laughs> um, and it, it may be something at some future point, we did look at it in the past, but um, it's the illiquidity that scares the daylights out of comptrollers and committee members because um, known as the illiquidity premium is that sometimes returns are enhanced because the investor can't sell it but a lot of times towns and, and controllers uh, they don't want they don't end up in that spot so it's been an asset class that we've avoided and i don't think we necessarily need to go there either um you know paying attention to the outside asset classes page nine you can see in 2021 uh this is for 1231 our equities did 21%, right? They carried the ball 12% the year before. And you know, no one should be shocked that fixed income lost 28 basis points because uh, that's what short-term fixed income did. Um, you know, the year before, a little different. You know, we had you know, almost a 4% return for ultra short, ultra safe investments. When you're invest, you really got to keep your eyes off of short term performance in, in any asset class, but particularly bonds. Um, don't throw in the towel in fixed income because, boy, you know, when uh, you know, I know that Afghanistan fallout didn't go the way we want, but you know, you hear occasionally whether it's North Korea or Iran, uh, if someone chucks a nuke. You're going to wish you owned these types of investments um, because there will be a massive uh, flight into them during those times. And then out to the right, you can see alternative investments up 40.5%, uh, bringing it all together 12.5% uh, of the return uh, to the portfolios. 
we don't have to go through the next two presentations if you guys are okay with that because well, let's go to the police one because the one difference in the police if you go to uh, page four you might remember that the police is a completely different plan and has a very different age and a very different demographic and the town plan pays out more than it takes in that's normal that's what's supposed to be happening and that's going to continue to happen that's that's how these things work because of the population and because of the, the way the whole actuarial process works police is a different situation and we have it uh we put in half a million dollars more than what we paid out in the police plan of course you know, paying attention to the actual or excuse me, rate of return, <coughs> you know, whether you put in more or less, it's inconsequential because the whole plan is built on that rate of return over long periods of time. And it incorporates the fact that the older plans were paying out more. And in fact, again, that trend will continue and continue and continue. And eventually, the town plan will be empty, right? Because no one's left it. Um, so that's the one difference that I thought I'd mention. Um, low SAP, you know, same portfolio. It's 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 uh, built on mutual funds and ETFs because it's a much. The other two portfolios, you guys right remember those are institutional. Uh, town owns the stocks. The town owns the bonds. Right, it's not a retail mutual fund. It's not a retail ETF. But the low SAP plan is it's only an $800,000 plan. So it's the same allocation, just using uh, different investment products. Returns are, are, are very, very similar, slightly lower. Um, and that's not always going to be the case. Sometimes they're going to have slightly higher. Um, I mean, it's really irrelevant over short periods of time. So, in, in sort of summary, um, I think we're going to have an opportunity uh, to reallocate our fixed income, um, whether it be you know next quarter or the quarter after that, or perhaps even the end of the year, when our time is going to come. And I think the key to uh, investments, whether it be your personal investments or whether it be the town pension plan, it's boring, but it's diversification. And diversification will win over long periods of time, every time. Um, and I feel comfortable where we're allocated now. Um, and perhaps we'll, we'll get into other ideas next quarter, but I feel good uh, where we are for the next three months. Very good report. And uh, I agree with you. Uh, we're going to see a lot of changes this year. The interest rates could go up four or five times. They might do quarter point. They might even do a shock or half point at some point. Probably they'll start out a quarter, but they could, along the line, go up a half. And that could lead to what you're talking about. And we might very well be looking this time next year, and we won't see a 0.28 on the fixed income. Yeah. We might see it turn out completely, but we might not see a 20.05 on, on the equity. But that's what keeps us in the ball game and also keeps us from going back to 2008 some other towns like cheshire that found themselves down 50 percent you want to avoid that you want to avoid going out on a limb with risk and this is what this is all about you know managing your risk and managing it for the long term do we have any other questions yeah mike i i actually have one uh, i'm not sure that i overheard uh, that i heard you correctly did you say that you thought that there would be possibly by the end of 22 um, an oversupply of goods on the shelves? Yeah, so one of the worries that Mike Wilson talks about is simple supply and demand. And the consumer has consumed. In other words, more goods and services were bought and sold because of COVID. Think about that, more, not less. And that the, the, the helicopter money from the government, that money is over. And that if you see, if we see this 
drop in demand. The other side is supply and the issues surrounding the supply chain are real, right? Particularly with Omicron. But Mike Wilson, uh, our CIO, you know, that supply chain is, is nimble and could accelerate. In that scenario, that's exactly what ends up happening. Um, a deflationary type environment where there's too much supply and, not, and, and the demand has dropped off. So that, that is one of the worries of, of our CIO. Yeah, I mean, that's not close to happening right now. I mean, there's still no. empty shelves. And um, yeah. so uh, I guess another question, did, did Mike talk about um, the auto industry at all relative to the lack of supply because of chips and stuff like that, because that's a big driver for the you know macroeconomic you know so piece that we have to deal with. Started off with semiconductors. Yep. In nine months, we're going to be swimming in semiconductors. Really? Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, the reports I've been reading, uh, the auto industry should be in a very bullish uh, position this year. So, category. so I think, oh, and I, and I know we talked about it last time, but you, you can look at lumber. Uh, you look at the, you know, lumber is down 70% from the peak. And that, you know, you drive that by Gateway Terminal in New Haven. I've never seen so much wood in my life sitting on those docks. Wow. And the demand. So, so again, it, Ken, it's 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 one of the things that our CIO is thinking of is the the opportunity for demand to really drop and supply to really catch up. And you said cars. I mean, he 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 is has high conviction that we're going to have so many semiconductors in about nine months. We're not going to know what to do with them. Huh. Well, thank you. Uh, the other thing I read was uh, oil was going to continue to go higher for a while. Um, it's over eighty-six dollars a barrel now. But, uh, the difference between that and uh, West Texas crude and the European is about two dollars. It's pretty tight. But they're thinking by summer it could come back again, and gasoline is going to go back down, which could help break some start breaking some inflation at uh, at seven percent now, and they feel it's going to stay at that for a little while longer. So you could start getting some counter trends by the summer, perhaps, and uh, and that should help. Well, but I think the wild card. It, sorry, sorry. Is the wild card is COVID. I mean, the supply chain right now is extremely disrupted because of Omicron, right? And staffing, and, and I mean, I know that there's other issues, but what if in nine months, you know, the, the, we're in a totally better? Let's, I, who knows? Maybe we're in a worse one, but but. Uh, assuming that you know one out of X amount of employees isn't home quarantined because of COVID, and that, that, that could make a big difference. And you always have the black swan events out there, something that could happen with China and Taiwan or or Russia and, uh, and uh, what's, the, what's the country there? Ukraine. 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 So, I mean, something could blow up there. Yeah. And that could put a twist in it. Could put sure. A, oh, yeah. Change everything. Right? And, and North Korea. Yep. yep. That, that could happen too. So uh, there are things out there on the horizon that you can't really plan on. That's what they call them black swans. They're out there. Maybe they'll never happen. But if they do, it, it could swing things around drastically for a short period. Yep. Okay. Um, any other questions on, on, on our thoughts and the investment uh, performances so far? And some forward thinking. Okay, Mike, uh, uh, I think we're pretty well set there. When's our next scheduled meeting, you know? I, I do know. I think it's right after tax time, sometime in mid-April. April 20th. Okay, April 20th. One o'clock. Okay, April 20th, one o'clock. All right. Any problem with that next meeting? Any no, that works for me. I'm good. Okay, works for me too. All righty, if we 
we have nothing else uh, on the table, uh, I make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Uh, I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good one, guys. See ya. <laughs> Mike. Legos. 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 You know what they, over the last, uh, since the 70s, profit per uh, percentage increase per year, 11%. Wow. If you buy the game, if you buy the boxes, don't open them and then sell them like three, four, five years later, <laughs> the return is 11% annum. Wow. Oh, my God. Yeah. Are you Legos. Are you a collector of them? Hmm? Uh, are you a collector of them? No, my son sent me an article on it and I started reading it. I, 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 there was, the news did something on, on, did they? on that. Did they? It was a study out of Russia, two women out of Russia. Yeah. And the specialty Lego kits, not the, the basic ones and the more expensive ones, if you buy those, you know, and you hold on to them for four or five years and then start to sell them, you're going to make 11% a year. Incredible. That's quite collectible. Tell me about retirement, Bob. I love it. I'm busy. This month is payroll taxes. You know, I got to get those out. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I'm ahead of the game right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I probably got two or three left to go with a week and a half to go. Yeah, well, I got a bunch of stuff up on my desk to get off 1099 to W2. That's it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This week, I got to work. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's doing okay. Yeah. You know, complaining every day. It's going to be 97 in March. Wow. So, any Omnicron cases in your we are, Right after Christmas, 14 of 17 of us. Wow. We think it was our son, but it could have been our son in law, too, that carried it. And we're all okay. together, okay. you know, Seriously. Christmas and Chris the day after Christmas. And, you know, one from each family didn't get it. <clears throat> my daughter-in-law didn't get it. My younger grandson didn't get it in Thomaston. And then uh, my granddaughter in Pennsylvania didn't get it. It's strange how it hit every, you know, certain people, not everybody. Well, so my son ha had it last week. Six out of 10 kids on the basketball team. Mm -hmm. But me, my wife, and my daughter? Nothing. Nothing. And how was his? I mean, my, mine was just barely like- had a snow. A cold, a yeah. bad cold. Yeah. You know, well, this but, Omicron stays above the throat. Delta yeah. Went to the right. Lungs. And it, it, it really didn't let you, it let you go and then bring it back in. And it was, that's the way you recovered, you know, slowly, you know. Uh, you felt really good. And then the next day, it's like, oh, I'm back mm -hmm. in a couple of steps, you know. Yeah. But, you know, it took about seven or eight days and it was gone. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, that's unbelievable. So. Yeah, but you know what? Coming from the biomedical industry, there's a new variant down in South America. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're we, gonna, you really don't know. We're going to learn the Greek uh, alphabet here. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, they think this new variant has elements of all of them. Is that true? The way it changes, you know, it, it, it's it's a virus. It, 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 yeah, and it, it always mutates. It's befuddling science completely right now. Just like Pfizer just released today a new pill for Omicron that just nails it completely. Well, now they got to scale up manufacturing. That's the issue. I was going to ask you about one thing. Uh, on, on the international scene, what's your, what's your thoughts about, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking because I, I lived yeah. in Europe for about four years. Oh, you didn't uh, turn it off. Is it off? Oh, I think it was still recording. Oh.